Superficially, the tarot is little more than an elaborate card game. A pack of 78 cards divided into five suits, four with a 14 card construction similar to a standard deck of playing cards, and a fifth trump suit comprising 22 elaborate hieroglyphs. These are commonly referred to as the minor and major arcana. Most of us are familiar in some way with the tarot, and may be happy to leave them as the trivial artefacts of would-be soothsayers and fortune tellers. And yet, the card's history is long and rich, far longer and far richer than one might expect for a mere game, with their purpose rumoured to encompass the deepest secrets of human enlightenment eternal and universal truths which were encoded into symbols and passed down from the time of the ancients. All of which makes the tarot not merely a frivolous way to guess the future, but a gateway to ancestral knowledge, and thus all the mysteries of the universe. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. In 1781, the French scholar Antoine Cour de Gébelin was in the midst of his magnum opus. Le Monde Primitif, or The Primitive World, was a multi-volumed epic, which set out to trace the ancient origins of mankind, particularly to illuminate upon what he believed was an advanced primeval civilization, whose level of enlightenment matched, if not surpassed, that of the time in which he lived. The subject matter which he covered was vast, and by the time he reached his eighth volume in 1781, Javelin had turned his attention to an area of history that had previously received very little attention – the tarot. In an essay within this volume, he asserted that the cards, specifically the 22 cards of the Major Arcana, were profoundly ancient Egyptian. Not merely that, their images concealed the Book of Thoth, having been encoded by ancient Egyptian priests some 2,000 years ago. Such was consistent with Jebelan's hypothesis of an advanced ancient civilization, with the Book of Thoth claimed to be a compendium of sacred texts written by the Egyptian god of wisdom and writing. This book, so it has been said, contained the whole philosophy of the Egyptians including their secret knowledge. Fueled by a prophecy which warned of the coming destruction of their civilization, including this book, the sages of Egypt were alleged by Jebelin to have produced a series of symbols so as to preserve the enlightenment of their people. The images of the tarot were therefore the last remnants of this archaic wisdom, with them having been passed down since antiquity and the fall of Egypt. And so, in the cards, Jebelin saw so much more than a game. He proposed them to be a store of universal knowledge. Such an idea had never, at least formally, been proposed before. Until this point, the tarot was largely taken for granted, being used alongside or in the place of standard playing cards so as to make games more interesting. Playing cards themselves had, by the 18th century, been around for a very long time, with printed decks appearing as early as 9th century China. It was in the later years of the 14th century that they first appeared in Europe, having come via Egypt and the Arabic world. Known as the mother of all European card decks, it was the Mamluk deck which set the form for what we today recognise as a standard deck of cards, and the tarot. With four suits, coins, swords, cups, and sticks, the Mamluk deck can be easily related to even the most modern of tarot decks. The first playing card decks of Europe also shared much in common with the four-suit Arabic cards. In this way, it was the cards which we today know as the major arcana that separated the tarot from their earlier playing card origins. Modern historians assert that these cards, with totemistic designs ranging from the star to strength to the devil, came about when card players desired more complexity from their games. Rather than dedicate one of the four existing suits as a trump suit, whose value would be greater and thus trump the value of the other suits, players wanted a dedicated trump suit with which to play. In this way, the cards of the major arcana are sometimes referred to as the trump cards. 
They were, mainstream belief tells us, designed by card makers to increase the challenge of card games. And yet, this is an explanation which has left many unsatisfied. After all, there are 22 trump cards, and not 14, as there are in the suits of the minor arcana. Not merely that, the emblemistic designs of these cards are wholly unlike the rest of the deck. What was the inspiration behind putting the star, or strength, or the devil into card form? Historians have been unable to offer an adequate explanation. And so it is here that Cour de Jebelin, writing much later than the Tarot's first appearance in the 15th century, attempted to offer a solution. Far from being a series of random designs propagated by card makers, the trump cards were intrinsically meaningful and full of occult purpose. Not only that, although Jebelin could not have possibly known this at the time, that the inspirational Mamluk deck entered Europe from Egypt can be said to be a peculiar coincidence when considered within the scope of his ancient Egyptian theory. Writing of the tarot, Jebelin was able to provide a reinterpretation of each trump card through an Egyptian lens. The star, which features a woman pouring jugs of water into a river, is in fact representative of the Egyptian goddess Isis, feeding the Nile with an ibis in the background. The figure of death in the 17th century Marseille deck bears similarities to the Egyptian ferryman of the dead. That Shebelim believed so strongly in these occult ancient origins was no doubt bolstered by his own occult background. By the time of his writing, Jebelin was a Freemason, having been initiated at a Parisian lodge in 1771. Some ten years later, he was rumoured to be a high-level member, connected to other senior secret society figures such as Benjamin Franklin. It could be presumed that he had acquired this tarot knowledge via such connections. Either way, being a Freemason and travelling in such circles, Jabalan would have been not merely comfortable, but ready to embrace the notion of immense antiquity, and secret knowledge and rituals being passed down through the generations. And yet, for all of this, and despite his theory of the tarot being well accepted by many, even to this day, some of Jebelin's strongest criticism has come from other esoteric scholars. Speaking of Cour de Jebelin, Colin A. Lowe, a tarot historian and Kabbalah scholar, has stated that Jebelin knew very little about the tarot. He knew nothing about the history of tarot. He knew nothing about playing cards in Europe. On top of this, his knowledge of Egypt was close to non-existent, with no visits to the country having been recorded, and, at a time before the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone, it being impossible for him to have understood the ancient language. Lowe concludes that Jebelin was pushing on an open door. People, most especially his Freemason friends and readers, were eager to believe in some sort of ancient secret history imbued within something as seemingly ordinary as the tarot. Similar to Lowe is the famous British mystic and writer Arthur Edward Waite. Writing in 1910, Waite was ruthless in his dismissal of Jebelin's Egyptian link. The circumstances under which the savant attained his certitude are briefly that he saw the game of tarot played at the house of a friend, and he there and then declared a that it was one of the Egyptian books, and b that it was the sole remaining vestige of the superb libraries and literature which once flourished in the valley of the Nile. Wait was adamant. There was no way that Jebelin was instructed in things Egyptian a generation or so before Egyptology. For all of this, one must not draw the wrong conclusions. Occultists and esoteric authors, however much they may disagree with Jebelin, do not necessarily dispute the tarot as being a source of universal knowledge. It is, in short, much more complicated than that. For example, according to Waite, whilst the cards may have no historical record before the end of the 14th century, he was still of the personal belief that they were much older, because of their symbolism. Their rich iconography, universal and timeless, cannot be overlooked. 
In this way, the tarot has attracted abundant and varied speculation as to its true nature. Where did the cards come from? What do they mean? What secret doctrine may we retrieve from them? Some, notably the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a secret society of which A. E. Waite was a member, have directly correlated the 22 trump cards to the 22 letters of the sacred Hebrew alphabet. Equally pointed to is the Kabbalistic Tree of Life and its 22 paths. Others have incited numerology, according to which 22 is regarded as a master number. Whatever the reasoning or outcome, all generally agree upon the same thing. The tarot offers a key to the mysteries of the universe. The French esoteric author Elifa Lévy summarized it as such. Cartomancy, the interpretation of cards for divination purposes, in its proper understanding, is a literal consultation of spirits, without necromancy or sacrifices. In short, it is real magic. As bizarre as these claims may appear, the universality of the tarot's major arcana cards is fundamentally compelling. Even outside of the dark chambers of secret society lodges, their symbols are recognisable and able to be integrated into human experience. Cards such as the Fool, the Lovers and the Hermit are easily correlated to different stages of life, the follies of youth, love and marriage, and those times when we pull away from those around us. Other cards like justice, the devil, death and judgement can be ascribed to things that happen to us. In each card, we may each find a meaning. In this way, it is interesting to consider the tarot in respect of psychology, most especially analytical psychology and the writings of Carl Jung. Most famously, he spoke of archetypes, primordial images which shape human behaviour. Such are inborn tendencies, distinct patterns of being which lie within us all, so as to mould and transform our individual consciousness. In forming his theory, Yun observed that stories from all over the world and across time everything from myths and legends, to fables, to the writings of Shakespeare, contained a set of well-defined themes which appear over and over again. Such are Yoon's archetypes. The anima and animus, the persona, the self and the shadow. These, it has been argued by many tarot readers and scholars, align perfectly with the 22 cards of the major arcana. For example, the anima and animus, the feminine and masculine elements of the psyche, can be seen together in the lover's card, and then separately in the empress, the high priestess and strength, and equally in the emperor, the hierophant and the hermit. Taken even further, Yun broke down the four main archetypes into twelve archetypal figures. These, including the wizard, the ruler and the sage, can be said to be even more clearly linked to the cards of the tarot. And so, once again, we see the notion of universal truths, this time birthed from psychology as opposed to mysticism and magic. Different terms describing the same thing. A consensus of belief becomes all the more compelling when one realises that, alongside the archetypes, Jung discussed synchronicity, the idea of meaningful coincidences and thus a hidden dimension to reality as well as the psychoid dimensions of archetypes, namely that these universal themes have both psychic and material aspects, much the same as the cards of the tarot. In this way, pulling a card from a tarot deck becomes intrinsically meaningful, with a message from deep within our consciousness being communicated through the archetypes, the universal themes depicted by the symbols. For Elifa Levy, this was a consultation of the spirits. For Carl Jung, this was analytical psychology. Today, many people who work with the tarot engage in this merger of psychology and the esoteric. Not merely do these cards, so it is believed, bring tarot readers into contact with secret doctrines of universal wisdom, but also themselves. By taking time for reflection, by dissecting the past through archetypal images, an individual is able to unlock more meaningful perspectives that they may not have otherwise considered, thus bringing their consciousness to the present so as to aid them in considering the future. 
To this extent, that the tarot can predict the future can be said to be a misconception. There are no finite endings, but merely paths and alternative outcomes to be considered within the context of universal themes. As such, it is very difficult to conclude either way the validity of the tarot as a genuine tool for spiritual enlightenment. There are no definitive answers, with it being up to the reader to pick apart and accurately apply the wisdom said to be contained within the cards. What can be attested to, however, is the immense therapeutic benefit that these cards bring. By encouraging users to question and analyse, they act as an autoscope for self-realisation, magnifying meaning, causes and effects, and so helping users to feel more in control of their lives. Personal testimonies, which are in abundance, describe everything from the tarot helping them to find the strength to leave an abusive relationship to putting them on the path to understanding more clearly the cause of, and thus how to end, an addiction. And so, perhaps this is the universal truth, the secret doctrine of which esoteric authors have been writing about for centuries, that the answers do not come so much from without as they do within. Sometimes we may just need an image of a chariot or of a hermit to help us realise it. Thank you so much for watching, and an extra special thank you to our members, both here on YouTube and on Patreon, who helped to choose the topic of this video, and more widely, helped to support the making of all of our content. If you are interested in becoming a member and being able to vote for video topics, get access to commercial free videos, exclusive member merchandise and more, you might like to check out the links on screen and in the video description. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not watch another now? Until next time, 